would be ready for the implanting of your word, Lord, so that we can receive your word deeply into our hearts and be transformed. We just ask you, Lord, just, just have your way, have your way, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful worship. And just thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, and we can go ahead and go online as well. And just thank you for being here. We're excited to see what the Lord's going to do. Um, and just, I think this is probably, we started doing these conferences, I believe, in 2015. Is that right? 2015? And so that would be nine years if my math is correct. I'm not sure if we did it every year, but almost every year. But anyway, this is the ninth, maybe the ninth year. And uh, yeah, I just was worshiping and I just remember, man, we've had some awesome times. Lives have been deeply impacted. And I remember one time in our old building, and I, was, I don't even know what year it was, but I remember Terry was speaking and as Terry was speaking, that place we were at was a pretty run down. But I remember we had some wood pallets that were, didn't look as nice as this up there. And Terry speaking and uh, you know, Terry's got that famous slogan that's going to go down like a rat sandwich that uh, all of you are familiar with. And uh, sure enough, as, <laughs> as uh, Terry's speaking, I look up and there's a literal a rat, because we had rats in that old building, a rat running across the top of that wood. And I was like, okay, this is so embarrassing right now. He was, I guess he knew Terry was about to lay down a zinger and he wanted to escape the rat sandwich. But, uh, you know, the... You know, Terry and Josiah and Isaac, they're like, the whole Bennett family are like family to us, really. They're just, it's, it's uh, truly like our family when we get together. We're just like, man, we love you guys so much. It's so much awesome, you know, talking with you guys and hanging out with you guys. And we're so blessed. And um, our lives have been so deeply impacted by their ministry. And, you know, probably the, the greatest testimony I could give about their ministry is when you meet the people that have listened to them and taken their message in and you talk to them and you're like, wow, okay, these people, they, have, they really are Christ-like. They know the Lord. And the fruit of your ministry, I, I think, is the greatest compliment you can give any minister is not just, okay, he's a great preacher or, and he is, the, both of them are great preachers. You know, they have great revelation, but it's the fruit of their ministry that you see. And I, I know, honestly, when I first you know, when dad first introduced me to Terry, I was thinking I, we had our first conference and I was really thinking everyone's going to come in and be really flaky. Honestly, I was like very like, like nervous about that. And when I started talking to people, I was shocked. I was like, these are really some awesome people. So that's a testament to their ministry, the fruit of their ministry. Um, and just anyway, we're eternally grateful for them and just have been deeply impacted by them, our family. So anyway, just looking forward to what God's going to do over these next three days. Um, Josiah is going to speak first. So Josiah, you can come on up, my friend. And uh, Josiah is uh, 37, uh, 37, right? About to be 37, but he's got, he's, he's a he's 37 year old body, but he's like a 70 year old soul. I mean, he's like, uh, me and him are like great friends. And, you know, so I don't mean, I mean, that's a compliment. So yeah. 70 year old body. Uh, yeah, me. Too many years, no. Oh. Too many years of football. Oh, okay. No, you're, you're in great shape. Anyway, but we look forward to it, man. Love you, brother, and just uh, go for it. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I agree with Brian. Uh, when you meet Christians who actually know the Lord, it's a shocking thing, isn't it? Uh, I do have a 70-year-old body and a 70-year-old mind. Too many years of football um, has ruined my body. That's why I'm thankful that the Lord is returning, so I get a new body, right? Isn't that a beautiful thought, the return of the Lord? Let's go back to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll uh, kind of begin our, our weekend. Uh, excited to be here. I'm thankful to be here, uh, and I'm thankful to be a part of what God's doing. Uh, I don't deserve it. None of us do, but the Spirit of God in His grace and His kindness and His mercy saw fit to draw us in spite of our... Uh, fallacy and failures in our life, and I'm thankful to God. You know, he's, before I pray, I'll just say this, he's gotten this, the most interesting group of misfits. <laughs> you guys remember the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Uh, it's the island of misfit toys. That's how I feel, myself being the chief one of those. 
Um, but I, I just I was just sitting here listening to us worship, um, and I'm just thankful to not be and forever uh, want to be. I don't that we're not. A, I'm not asleep, and that I'm being continually awakened. That's an incredible thing when you think about it. We are being awakened to the Lord Himself. That we are excited. There's people excited about the moment in which we live. At the time, I believe this, the time that Jesus said, which would cause great fear, and essentially to cause men upon the earth to be paralyzed by fear, there's a people excited to hear the testimony of Jesus and to be actively a part of what God is doing. That's, that's a, it's an incredible thing. It's an incredible moment we live in. So let's, let's pray and then I'll... Kind of begin, Lord, we love you, and we don't take this moment, I don't, for granted. Lord, your voice, your word, your revelation, your understanding that you are bringing to us, Lord, none of us deserve it, but your invitation to come and eat, to dine, to open the door to you so that we can sup together. To be a part of the remnant that you're gathering, that you're calling out of the nations, that you're calling out of Christianity. Lord, we are thankful. We are grateful. It is by your doing alone that this is happening. It is by your doing, Lord, that you've given us ears to hear and a heart to respond You've given us, Lord, an unction in our spirit to turn to you, to see, to run this race, Father, without shrinking or turning back. I pray for us, Lord, that you would further anchor us in your Son, in Christ, in the will of God in our moment that you would be the anchor for us, Lord, in our souls, which can be so easily shaken in moments like these. I pray, Lord, for us that all that you have called to walk with you and who have responded, not one would be lost. But all of us, Spirit of God, would journey with you to the end we would be cleansed and purified, made ready, spotless, without blemish, without wrinkle. Lord, that we would not be uh, ashamed or offended with the work of the Lord in our time. I pray, Lord, that as you continue to go deeper into our inner man and you continue to sift your body, we would fall more in love with you as you continue to uproot and shake everything within us that needs to be shaken, Lord, in my life, in my heart, in my mind, in my actions, in my words, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work amongst us, your penetrating work, Lord, that goes deep into the inner man. Lord, I thank you for those here at Restoration Life that they're on this journey. I thank you for Brian, for Ken, And for Michael and for Randy, Lord, all those and others, Lord, that you have drawn, Lord, I ask for the spirit of encouragement to us all this weekend. Lord, I know that this can feel uh, lonely and we can feel alone, Lord, but we're not alone. You aim for your strength to be in and amongst us like never before in history. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to open our eyes to the moment in which we stand. That our proclivity, Lord, to not see rightly what you're doing would be broken off of us, Lord. It's a great hindrance, especially, I think, in the West, to hear and to see for a moment, but to 
quickly have our gaze stolen off of who you are and what you're doing. God, I pray that you would give us that ability to keep singleness of eye upon you and your work. We live, Lord, in momentous times. We live in a great shift, Lord. We live in a great transition. I believe the final transition. So we ask again, Holy Spirit, that your hand, the weight of your burden, and your will in this matter would rest heavily among, upon us and amongst us, not just this weekend, but to the end of the age. We would not be ashamed, Lord, to, to speak of it in that way. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you can kind of tell by my prayer where I'm going with my message. Uh, I, I believe we live in a final time moment, if we'll allow it, if we'll desire it, if we'll stay in it. We live in the final move of God to bring His people out of Babylon and make a city in which only Christ himself being seated on his throne within us and amongst us reigns. That is a very uh, specific thing to say, but I, I say it unashamedly. I think many in the room, I know many of you, um, you would say the same thing. Feel, you're feeling the same thing. You're desiring the same thing. You're hungering for the same thing. And you're asking for God to do that thing, it's not a thing, within you. So I am excited. I'm excited. I'm not excited about this pulpit because I had a run in with one of these in Arkansas and I left my, lost my Bible on the floor about three times. Isn't that right, Todd Wolf? <laughs> See, there we go. So I'm going to do something here if that's okay. I'm going to get rid of my binder. Bear with me. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room. Believe it or not, I do use notes from time to time. It's one of my last great sins that God needs to cleanse me of. I'm just trying to feel my way to see what we're... You know, I told uh, Michael this... Um, We've preached at each other traveling up here, Dad, Isaac, and myself, and then Ben and Ken, and when we all got to marry, we've preached at each other all day. I'm confused on what I'm supposed to preach on, because we've gone basically from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So, just trying to see what the Lord's wanting to do. There's a weight of the Lord in this moment. I don't know if you guys are feeling it. We don't live in the same time as even the beginning of the year. The burning of the Lord and the fire of God and what He wants is intensifying. And His fiery passion and the eyes of the Lord that search to and fro they are searching. With those eyes comes the sword of the Lord to refine His people. This is something that I've been talking about as we've been traveling because I've been commanded by the Lord to do it because of the moment we're in. Um, this is not a moment where just the um, this is not a moment when I speak about what I'm speaking 
on tonight and get into it where we're just talking about the general dealings of God. We're talking about what God does to make a final remnant vessel ready. We have to hear that from God as much as it's a challenge to our ears and our belief system and what we've heard before. We were talking about this and the Lord's been on me personally about my lack of expectation of the return of the Lord. We've lost the hunger for Christ to return. You know, there's a time where there was an expectation, a right expectation for the return of Christ. And it was not an expectation just because evil was evil and we wanted to get away from it. There was an expectation of culmination between Christ and His bride. There was an expectation of being married to the Lord Himself of an aspect of union with God in Christ that had not ever been thought of before in human history, before the New Testament and Christ himself coming and speaking of it and then it further being revealed to Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 5, speaking of Christ and His church and a bride for Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Revelation 19 The marriage supper of the Lamb and a bride being made ready. We've lost this aspect of looking for and longing for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's been in my face about that uh, very much so because we fight this battle in our own minds of could this really be true? And could we really be the final generation? And haven't many said what we're hearing before? And I'm telling us that we've lost, we've lost, not to our benefit, but to our destruction, the expectation of not just the Lord coming to judge, That's a part of it. Jesus said, Matthew 24, about those who, when delay happens, they begin to eat and drink with the drunkards and they begin to beat the sheep. It says that the Lord would return in a moment that they did not expect and that He would cut them into pieces. We've lost an aspect of that of the fear of God, but we've also lost this aspect of for love's sake, for love's sake, the return of the Lord, longing for the Lord to be with the beloved, as Paul did. He longed to go and be with the Lord, but stayed behind for the sake of the church. In his time, and so I know, I know right off the bat that All of us, all of us are having to struggle through and fight the spirit of unbelief that we are in this time. And it's a war that must be waged. Satan has done such a good job of making the return of the Lord be a set time and a set date versus a cooperation of a vessel being made ready. And I'm just going to tell us, if we don't have an expectation and a longing for Christ to come because He gets what He wants in us inwardly in kind, then we'll never be made ready. That may not make sense, but as the, the further the Lord takes you down this path, you will begin to see how necessary expectation in the preaching of the return of the Lord is. What, let me say this, what we are preaching and conveying 
has nothing to do with just being right. Let me say that again. What we are coming with and what we are saying, and I know Brian and Ken are talking as well, what God is placing within us about the return of the Lord has nothing to do with being right. It has to do with being readied. This message of readiness transcends being right or being wrong. Can you hear what I'm saying? The fear of being wrong must be driven from our hearts. Isn't that right? The fear of being wrong must be driven for, from our hearts. We must with courage begin to expect, as the apostles did in the New Testament, the return of the Lord. We must be... We must join with them in being able to say, hear me, the Lord is at the door. If I'm going to be wrong, I'm going to be wrong being biblical. <laughs> this, whole, this whole nonsense that we've fallen into, and it's been a beautiful ugly trap of the devil to get us to where we are okay and um, satisfied with being in this world has got to go. We have our scripture f verses for it. We have our reasons why but the Lord is moving on a people with the spirit, a right spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, not a wrong spirit, of discontent. With staying in the cycle that the church has found itself in for 2,000 years. And the Spirit of God is giving understanding into the mysteries of God. Of why the delay of His return. We have to come to grips with this fact that God in His perfect foreknowledge has saved this mystery, though I believe, and Dad has said this and I agree 100%, the invitation has been there from the beginning after Christ's, Christ's ascension. Though that invitation was there, and you see it present in the apostles, the mystery of God as to readiness being the key to his return has been saved for the generation who would say yes. I'm not saying that it's never been seen before. I'm not saying it's never been preached before. I've never heard of it, but that doesn't make, I mean, it's not so. But I'm saying that the emphasis of the Holy Spirit has been saved for the generation who would say yes. And you and I are meant to be a part of it. And that revelation of the Lord is meant to change us in every conceivable way. It is meant to change the way we do church. It is meant to change the way we live. It is meant to change the way... Uh, change our appetites and change our desires and change our hungers and change what we thirst for, what we live for, what we give ourselves to, what we put our eyes on, what we talk about, what we talk about amongst one another, what we pray for, what we intercede for. If it doesn't grip us to that degree, we will have another delay. 
but I don't believe we're going to. I firmly believe that whether I'm a part, whether any of us in this room are a part, and I believe you are, you're meant to be, that's why you can hear this kind of message, but it, it, that the Spirit of God has come out to bring it about. And I, say, I, hate, I, sh I hate to say this, but I think there's truth in it. The smallest part of the remnant of God will be made up in the West, in the American church, in Europe. The smallest portion, because we've known so much, we've had so much theology and so much teaching on the return of the Lord. We have every reason why it can't be in our time and every reason why it's just some random date and time off in the future. And we have some, all of our explanations of why the church is already at a good place and we already have all of God and we have already been filled into the fullness of God and there's nowhere left to go and we're basing everything on money and uh, uh, how many people we have in the pulpits and how big, of our, how big our buildings are. And we're missing, we are missing the Lord so much in the West. And so the Spirit of God is absolutely going to shake everything that can be shaken in the West. My expectation of this time is the greatest trials and tribulations that the world has ever seen. The remedy for you and I who've been exposed, and hear me, I'm just, it's not, a, hey, these people out there in these other churches, it's myself included. We ourselves have been inundated for years and years and years of American Christianity. And we have been, I believe this, we have been on a journey out to the Lord, but we need heavenly aid. Yes. That heavenly aid from God is going to come by some of the most difficult situations and circumstances we've ever known. Amen. Without the refinement of God in this uh, way, we will never come into the fullness of what God has. So I'm excited. I'm excited to be in this moment. I don't want to take it for granted. As uh, the birth pangs of Matthew 24 continue to unfold on the earth, there's another birthing out of Revelation chapter 12 that's going on. It's not just what's being birthed in the hardship in the earth. There's a birthing of God's man-child. We are in historic times, brothers and sisters. Do not let the devil dupe you into thinking we're not. My greatest fear for the body of Christ in our nation is that we hear, but don't hear, and see, but don't see. My greatest fear is that, specifically for the West, who's been so churched, who's had so much preaching and teaching on the return of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, etc., etc., that we know so much about it up here, that we miss the opportunity to become the people that it's being talked about. Isn't that right, Dad? I know you've said that a million times. That's my fear within my own heart. And it's not a fear that causes me to run from God. It's a fear that brings me into right fear to run towards him in this time and to guard and to protect my heart to be a part of what God is doing. And I'm talking about it in an inward way. Though it's going to get into every arena really quick. So, 
That's the opening. Let's go to the book of Daniel. So I think it behooves us to understand if we be in that time and we stand in that time and we're going to live in this time, what God is doing in this time. There's a lot of stuff we could say God is doing. There's a lot of stuff we could say God has done in the past. Isn't that true? Part of what the Lord is having to do for us in the West is to get the expectation of what has been in the past out of us so that we can see what he's doing in the now. God is not bringing us back to a movement of the past. God is not desiring us to redig the wells of our fathers and what they did. God wants us to honor the God of the past. But God wants us to be with him in the present moment of our season. A generation who's looking to what happened in a prior generation will never be useful to God in the moment. A generation that's longing for what's over their shoulder will miss the opportunity to become today. And let me say this again. What God is doing in the past is not what he's doing in the present. Why? Because that was not the final generation. The final generation has a unique work of the Lord within them and around them. What is that work, Josiah? That work is called refinement and purging. The time of the end, as prophesied by Christ himself, as the apostles prophesied, will be the greatest time of turmoil the earth has ever seen. And it is the perfect, uh, it is the perfect uh, thing. It's not the right word. It is the perfect antidote to the rebellion in the house of God. Now, I know no one in here thinks they're rebellious to the Lord. But I can say for myself that there's uh, work to be done. You see, God's not looking for just... Me coming partially out. He's looking for me to come all the way out. God's not looking for a small testimony of his son. He's looking for a full testimony of his son. God's not looking for a church that's got some things right in the book of Revelation. He's coming to rebuke those things that need to be strengthened. And that need to be brought forth so that there can be a full testimony of the Lord Jesus, so that there can be a full expression of the will of God in the earth before his return. So there is reserved. You have a reservation from God in this time. What is that reservation? It is the refinement of God. That refinement of God begins in the inner man, setting up the throne of God in the heart. The the afflictions that God uses begin with Christ versus religious Christianity in our hearts. Has that, why do I say that? Has that not been what God is doing with so many of us? I can, where's my hand to that? God has absolutely been doing that. That is one of the most painful things to go through. 
believing that you've got it. And God comes and says you don't. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about being ready. Being filled to the way the Lord is once. That is a confrontation. And it either makes you offended with God and makes you shrink back into your religious spirit. Or it makes you to repent and humble yourself. And come out to Jesus in a progressive way. A process of God. So it's an inward work first. And what God does in the outward is to continue to establish himself inwardly. Okay? But God's going to give us some aid in another way. Outward afflictions. Let me encourage you. Many of you in the room have been undergoing outward afflictions. And you've probably been wondering, what is the source of those afflictions? And though I can't speak to every single one of them, because I'm not God, I can tell you what God's desire for the outcome of those afflictions to be. Conformity to his image. Let me help us, let me help us to reframe the context of our understanding of affliction. I've been preaching about this a lot and this isn't the thrust of my message tonight as far as coming out of this book. But I've been hitting heavily on the book of Job and there's a reason for that. Number one, God told me to. Two years ago, God told me, Job's testing is coming to God's remnant. Hear me. The furnace of affliction from God is for those who are his, not for the wicked. Now, the wicked are going to get judgment and affliction in that way, but I'm talking about God's kindness and grace to take us through the valley of the shadow of death. Where he takes us beyond our own ability to stand. And we learn to trust him in the midst of the thing we're going through. Yes. That seems so trivial. That seems so trite. We've heard it preached a thousand times. We have, but now we get to live it. And we get to see, by the grace of God, and those who rely on him in the moment, who will go forward. See, there's a great distinction coming in our time. This, the distinction isn't just what message we're hearing or what message we're preaching. The distinction is who is going to endure the content in our lives of what was preached. Meaning, are we actually going to walk through with faith and without fear what we have been talking about, namely the cross of Jesus Christ? Are we going to allow the cross of Jesus Christ to purge and refine and bring us into the relationship that is called for, or are we going to, for us, stop short of just hearing it with the ear and giving lip service to the reality of it, but not journey, journey with God through the fire of it? Are you guys okay out there? Yes. Is, this, is this too intense? No. This, is encour this should be encouraging. You guys are already going through it. I know. I am. We are, we are what was it I said, Brian? You remember better than me. This is the pre-tribulation tribulation. tribulation. <laughs> Back to Job. What's, what, what's so beautiful about Job, and I can't, preach, I can't preach out of Daniel and all of Job, but what's so beautiful about Job, and it should help our hearts, is this aspect of the way the testings of God, God allowed Satan, used Satan in Job's life. Amen. The way those testings came, because they're so, uh, they hit home for us. You see, 
There's many today around the world who are undergoing persecution for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? And we should remember them and we should pray for them and we should be thankful for their testimony. And they are having their day of affliction and it's very much that way. Either deny Jesus or be killed or deny Jesus or you'll be put in prison or deny Jesus and this thing or that thing. That has not come to America yet. But what, I, what God doesn't want us to fall into is thinking that for what he needs to do within us in this aspect of refinement, let me, let me say it this way. He doesn't want to miss our day of visitation because it doesn't fit with ju just within that context. The book of Job hits home for all of us. Job was tested in the most uh, difficult but common of ways. His family, his finances, his body, his own body. He was struck with an illness, a skin disease where he literally had to scrape the sores. He was struck with the accusations of those closest to him, his friends, his wife. And here's Job who has this testimony from God. There's no one like him in the earth. And yet who gets refined? Not the others who don't know God as good as Job does. Job who does know God. There's a scripture in Isaiah 31, verse number 9. It says that the furnace of God is in Jerusalem. It's not in the other nations. Where God is refining, and we've got to catch hold of this lest we be offended with God in our time. And in our moment, in this now moment that we are in. And we miss the opportunity to see the readiness that God is offering It's not, God allows Babylon to refine the church. What do you mean by that, Josiah? God, you see this in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. God has allowed Babylon to remain to refine. Once we are refined, and this goes back to the book of Daniel, and I'll get to it sometime before the millennium. God allows and has allowed the spirit of Babylon in the church to refine those who will come out and be made ready for the Lord and become the remnant of God. To be those who journey out, like in uh, Zerubbabel's day. I know Dad's going to talk some about this, but Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah. Daniel's taken into Babylon, and it is a fight the entire time to stay committed to God. Is that not right? So, let's read some of the Bible. Don't you love the Bible? Isn't the Bible true? I don't always have the right interpretation, but God's word is true. Even if every man be found a liar... And so I say that because if we want to know the truth, back to what I was saying 20 minutes ago, if we want to know the truth of what the end will look like, it's been recorded for us in the scriptures. So Daniel chapter 12, um, verse number one. Now, I don't know what Bible you have. This is the NASB. And the uh, title, and this is accurate, uh, is the time of the end. And so I just want us to understand the context of what Daniel is seeing here and the prophecy that God gives him hundreds, now hear me, hundreds of year, years before the coming of Christ, God gave Daniel an accurate 483 year in advance prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ. And Daniel gives God, uh, God gives Daniel a prophecy of us at the end. 
of where we are and what's going to be going on. It's incredible when you think about it. Things that were written thousands of years ago, about 2,600 years ago, have come to our doorstep. Can we, can we believe that? <laughs> Verse 1, speaking of the, the end. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred. That's the wind of the Holy Spirit. My notes going everywhere. Something with my notes, and I don't know. I think God doesn't want me to use them anymore. Oh, these right here? I thought they were push pins. I was going to start sticking them in you guys when you fell asleep. I know it's boring, but that's awesome. Okay, uh, so now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard of the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Let me, let me go on. At that time, your people, everyone who's, uh, yeah, and at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, I just want to make a note because Jesus references this in Matthew 24. Um, there's no way that Daniel chapter 12 and Matthew 24 are speaking about AD 70. It's impossible. That time of AD 70, I don't know what, again, I'm just saying this to help us to understand because we have to see ourselves, and God has left a testimony of what's going to be going on in the earth so that we can have, and I'll get to this in verse 10, insight and understanding. Satan has weaved in a false preterism and partial preterism theology into the church to, quanti to make these theologically something of the past, and they're not. It's amazing that we can read the Bible and have such understanding of the scriptures but miss the simple reality in truth. Even in verse 2 that talks about the resurrection from the dead, there was a whole sect called the Sadducees in Jesus' time who did not believe in the resurrection from the dead, though this passage says it. Bible knowledge is good, but we need the Holy Spirit to interpret the scriptures. And more than just interpret, needs, we need him to bring us in to what it's speaking about in a relationship. So verse 3, I love verse 3. <clears throat> it says, and those who have insight, these are those who know God and have a relationship with God. Daniel 11.32 says that there will be those who know their God and take action. Now some people will say, uh, I hesitate to bring this up after what I just said, but some people will say, well, that was during the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Um, and that's a historical dynamic. Uh, irregardless of your viewpoint on that part of Daniel 11, there's a principle that's at work here. Is that in the midst of deception and darkness, that God brings unto himself a people to know him and to respond rightly and to be useful to God in such moments. Daniel was one of them. Daniel was taken away, not because of his own sin, but because of the sin of a nation who had forgotten God. Daniel lived, though he was there, lived as separate from Babylon. He was in a continual fight to resist the spirit of Babylon. 
and to glorify God. It began in the very uh, beginning of chapter 1 and 2 when he comes into the king's court and they ask him to eat the food of Babylon and he would not, not he defied that edict. It comes again under King Darius where he has to pray only to him for 30 days and no one else. And Daniel resists and obeys God and thus is thrown into the lion's den. We know that story. Daniel is praying and interceding for his nation to come back into the will of God. Daniel has insight and understanding that it's the time of God for the people of God to come out of Babylon. May God give us that understanding. May God give us that revelation. And we're not just coming out of something, we are coming into someone. And it's not just ethereal where we hear a message and we clap our hands and we tell the minister that was a good message. It changes us from within. It changes the way we live and the way we act. It makes Jesus be brought to bear in the earth through the church that is ready. I, for one, am sick. I was talking to Michael about this before the meeting. You know, in the church of Jesus Christ, we all have our theologies about this, and I don't think any of them are right. We have a fear of speaking about sinless perfection, but we are okay with talking about sinful expression in God's house. What is wrong with that picture? What has the church of Jesus Christ become? Since when has the church of Jesus Christ been okay with darkness? Since when has the church of Jesus Christ been accepting of a lifestyle of practicing sin? Since when has there not been a challenge of the Holy Spirit to purify a people? And when those who come amongst who want to play games and act like they're apart, but inwardly, inwardly, they're not there with the Lord, they're struck dead and great fear comes upon those who are around the church. That is meant to be the normal in the house of God. Now, I'm not saying that I'm there. I'm not saying that any of us are there. But I am saying that God aims to perfect his people. That the testimony of the church will be of light and not of darkness. And God will get us out of our fear of pressing forward and bring us into fear to sin against a most holy God. What? Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm not as much of the choir as I think I am. I'm speaking of myself. I'm telling you there's a testimony of Jesus that has never been seen in the earth corporately in God's house. Satan has done such a good job of tricking us to be fearful of that kind of oneness with Christ. That type of life oneness where the only life that's coming out of his own body is his own life. I don't care about a doctrine of sinless perfection. I want to be a part of a people, a living stone that doesn't emit darkness but only emits his life that is light. If you're telling me that's not possible, I'm telling you that this book is a lie, and it's not. We've become way too okay with being in this world, and instead of the church of Jesus Christ being elevated on a hill outside of it, bearing his light and bearing his testimony, where a church, there, that there's meant to be a church where the gates of hell have no part in that church. And that does not mean this building. That means you and I. 
That means the way we live. That means what we think. That means what we give ourselves to. I am convinced of better things for us, brothers and sisters. Again, I'm not just trying to get us, well, just a, a, a do this and a don't do that. I'm talking about another than life. I am talking about a new creation come to fullness. Let me say it better. I'm talking about a body, a corporate body body that is under the headship of Jesus. And if, we're, if you're going to tell me that the church, when it comes into its proper place under Christ's headship, is going to be a place of compromise and mixture and darkness, I am going to resist that 100% because that's not the will of God and it never has been. So I'm up here in the book of Hosea, so the Holy Spirit must make... I'm telling you, the wind of the Holy Spirit's taking me all over. So, let's get back to verse 3. Again, this is, a, this is a unique moment. God would match... We live in a time of deception, of great deception. Great deception. And more is coming. God would match with the enemy's attempts to destroy what God is doing if we would ask him and go all the way and forget all of these doctrines and theologies that have been poured into us as the church. I'm not just talking about our lifetime. We have to understand that we are in a line of hundreds and thousands of years of Christianity that has been lumped into who we are and what we believe. We are a product of it, whether you realize it or not. And that does not die easily. And God is coming on to the scene to wipe all that away, to give us a clean slate so that we can become in the earth what he's wanted. Amen. And so Daniel says in chapter 12, verse number 3, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Paul said that we would, or meant to, shine as luminaries. Yes. Meant to be an example of the Lord Jesus Christ in light in the midst of a wook, wicked, in, a wookie, no, not a wookie, I like Star Wars, but a <laughs> wicked and crooked and perverse generation. The problem is, is that the wickedness and the crookedness and the perversity is just as prevalent in the body of Christ as it is anywhere else. And that the name of Jesus Christ is being blasphemed among the nations because of what calls itself his house. Satan has us afraid. Satan has us afraid to allow the light of the Lord in in that way. May God break it off of us. God, Satan and doctrines of demons, and maybe they were men with good intentions, I don't know, but have made us feel okay, okay, and, would, and has us in a place where we would rather... Be acceptable and understood by the wicked and the world rather than being separate and distinct yes. unto God. Is that not true? So, they're going to shine like the expanse. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. As for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Is that not happening in our time? 
the knowledge, it's not just worldly knowledge, it is, but the knowledge, one of the greatest hindrances to the church in the West is our external knowledge of God. Maybe I should say it better, is our facts about God, rather than the fruitfulness of God in and through us. We have known so much, but come into so little. So I'm setting the stage for us. I know it seems bleak, (laughs) but it's not. God has a plan for us, and I'm getting to it. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. One said to the man dressed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time. Let me, let's just stop there. The word of God is true. These things will come to pass. We have to hear that again. These things are not fairy tales. They will come to pass. Daniel's prophecies have come to pass. And the ones beforehand. This vision, this prophecy of Daniel will come to pass. He swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. These words are sealed up until the generation comes who will become and go through what's being talked about. And if we believe the Lord has broken the seals and is breaking the seals, the Lord is releasing the reality and the revelation of this to us so we can understand what we are and what we are going to go through. Not to make us fearful, but to make us refined in the process. Verse 10, well, let me hit verse 9 again because verse 10 is really the, it's the punchline. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. And I want, I want verse 10 to hit us right where we're sitting. Many will be purged, will be purified, and will be refined The wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Let me say this. There's a couple ways you can look at that passage, and I think there's layers to it. Those who are being purged, purified, and refined, what actually is uh, meant there is purified is be made white. Like in the book of Revelation, to the overcomers, you will be given white garments. Part of the understanding, and this is kind of where I've heard it come from, is they're going to have understanding of the, of the time they're in. And that's absolutely true. But they're also going to understand what was just mentioned, the need for the purging, the purification, and the refining work of God. They're not going to be caught unaware Hear me, the book of Revelation screams this at us. And the other passages, uh, what Jesus says himself, and I'll read a couple of them. But the end is all about the endurance of the saints. And it's not just an enduring just to get through it. It's an endurance to be made ready in the midst of it. It would be very easy for us if we do not understand. This is why God wants these things preached. 
If we do not understand what God is doing in the midst of these times, we will be easily offended by God. If we do not understand, hear me, again, let's break our context for just a second. I understand that this thing is where, where we're at and what's going to happen is going to get more real in the world. And for us who think we have understanding of end-time eschatology, it might fit into some of our parameters. It may not. But what I don't want, for myself included, is to miss the refinement of God which comes through the most seemingly mundane aspects of my life. If it's the little foxes that ruin the vineyard, it can also be the little things that prune it and cause it to bear more fruit. If what you're going through is challenging your trust and relationship with God, you are in the midst of the refinement I'm talking about. If you're being hit and struck in this right drew, in your body, if your finances are being shaken, and again, all of ours to some degree are going to be, if your family's coming after you because they think you're in some weird cult that preaches holiness and not lukewarmness, for some of us, and I hate to say this, it shouldn't be this way, if our spouse doesn't understand. Understand that there was a man named Job who went through the same thing. And the outcome of his testing was a double portion in a relationship that he didn't have when it began. See, God didn't just use Job in that scenario like I've heard it said many times, I'll say it this way, God, Job did not come out the same. Job was a righteous man. Job had come out to God. There was no one else like him. Hear me, remnant of God. It is for us that the furnace of God is reserved. furnace is in Jerusalem, not in Babylon, not for Babylon. Babylon gets destruction. God's people get refinement. Don't expect, peop don't expect people who are not going down this narrow way to have understanding of what you're going through. They won't. They can't. Job's friends had no understanding of what he was going through. Their own, the only thing they could surmise was that he had done something wrong. Little did they know is be, it was because he had done something right. God help us. We have this so twisted. Now we could just be general about that. I'm not talking about something general. I'm talking about something in our season of time right now where refinement unto readiness is taking place now. Yeah. Not tomorrow, not next week, not three years from now, not seven years from now, not 20 years. I don't know how many years we have left. But the remnant of God is given, being given opportunity to be refined in the fire today. And if we miss this, we miss the very will of God for us in our generation. We miss the reason that God put us on this globe in this moment. Everything in our life has been building to this season of time. Will we go forward or will we too shrink back like so many who've gone before. I'm telling you what happened in the New Testament was they had gone only so they had gone so far and the Lord was right 
at the door to put the finishing work on the remnant and they began to look back. And they deviated and they left. And so much of that, you can see it as you really look over from a 30,000 foot view of the Gospels and the New Testament, let's say this, the epistles. So much of it was because of the measure of difficulty that they were going through. Peter tells them, arm yourselves for this very purpose. You are in spiritual warfare, suffering as Christ suffered to be perfected as Christ himself was. Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 5. Though he was a son, he was perfected by what he suffered. Who he was was proven out by enduring and giving himself to God yes. no matter what he went through. Yes. I'm telling you, there is no other way that those who are going to bear that name in fullness are going to be ready except through that same Gethsemane, if we can say that type of uh, if we can say it that way, it's not just a one-time event, but without their own Gethsemane time. Yes. Daniel says it. Many are going to be purged, purified, and refined. That time at the end, the time of great distress and trouble, is meant to make us further readied and to put the finishing touches of purifying God's house. You guys had enough yet? I don't even know how, how long I've been up here. Brian? More? Okay. Don't you just love Jesus? Aren't you thankful to be in this time? I'm so thankful God is setting us free from fear of this moment. God, hear me. You have to hear, we have to understand this. God has made us for this moment to have courage and not be fearful. Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear and for an expectation of what's coming up on the earth because the powers of heaven are going to be shaken. Revelation 21, I'm going to turn there real quick. This is something I want to hit, and there's this aspect of fear, because I know, I, I know fear gets us. And I'm not saying this is going to be fun. I'm just saying it's going to be fruitful. And if we're after the Lord... In his testimony, this is the greatest moment to be alive in human history. If we are after the Lord getting the body knitted, formed, fashioned, and filled with only his life that we've longed for, that we've been praying for, interceding for, standing for, proclaiming, this is the time. I just ask us, and I know it's a challenge, and it challenges me. Is that really, is that really what we're after? Are, are we just a part of something that talk? I'll say this true back at the gathering, okay? I'll say this true of myself, who's been traveling um, with, a, with a forerunner, with a messenger, with a John the Baptist vessel. You can be a part of it, around it, and come into agreement with, with it intellectually and not bear it in your body and in your life, in your inner man. How is this thing proven, what I'm talking about? You see, we've heard it preached, and we've said yes, and now God is bringing it forth. And his way forward is not a snap your fingers and we're ready. His way forward is through the valley of the shadow of death. 
His way forward is to bring what we've honored in other men and women in the scriptures, like the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Bring us into that same type of scenario where we are tested to the nth degree and are, again, are moved beyond our own ability to stand. But we, like Paul, if we turn to the Lord, run to the Lord, we find out that God's able to make us stand. Revelation 21. You know, Revelation 21 is such a beautiful. Sometimes I just like to read it to remind myself of what's coming. I'm not going to do that to you guys because we'll be there for a while. Revelation 21 verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit these things again. It's those in Daniel chapter 12 who are purged, refined, purified, made white. That's being spoken of. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Don't you want that? Creation is longing and groaning for the revealing of sonship in Christ. Christ is revealed as the head of a new creation, the firstborn among many brethren, that to see, to see the Lord and to see His bride, this is God's desire, there would be no distinction in nature and in life. Do you believe that? It's absolutely the truth of it doesn't make us God in any facet. It makes us a creation that God uniquely designed spirit, soul, and body. The only creation in all of creation that has the call and the creative act of God so that where that the, the living God can come within and possess that people and that it's not just a one or two all of all of humanity was made to be in that same life united to express the one which is Jesus Christ that's an incredible thought you were ne- uniquely created to be a dwelling place of God a habitation of the holy spirit There is no other creation that is given and afforded that opportunity. So what is it if we have to suffer for his namesake? There was a time in the body of Christ where many, many counted themselves worthy to suffer for the sake of the Lord. We've lost it. We've lost it because we've sought prosperity and we've sought blessing and we've sought our own way, but we have not sought what God wants and what God gets, a dwelling place that is clean and that is ready to be invaded by the living God and to be and to house him forever inwardly, not just as an individual. It's not just about what I get. It's a corporate body, all of us together, to rightly display the nature of God. So God is dealing with our individualism in the body of Christ, in America specifically. We have so many books about teaching us your own personal intimacy with God, and I'm not against them because it takes individual living stones to be built into that dwelling place. But I'm telling you the way forward, again, don't get me wrong, I believe in that reality, and I, and I want to live it, and I, I do, and I... 
there's more of God to do in me in that way. But I'm telling you, it's not just your own personal devotion that God's asking for in that way of what can I be. It's seeing the body become what it's meant to be under the head Jesus Christ. And until we get to that burden, and by the way, that burden comes mainly through the apostles, the prophets of God, and comes to the body to lead us into a right understanding and intercession, not just prayers with our lips, but expression with our lives. That's the best intercession there is. Until we have that burden of God, we're just spitting in the wind talking about readiness. Until it impacts us that there's a corporate expression of Christ in fullness. Until we come onto that ground. I said this last week, we're preaching at the gathering. It's not enough for Paul to have that, his understanding. It's not enough for Jesus to preach the way he did and have ultimately, as the Son of God, all understanding. The body, the people of God must come in themselves and they must go together and journey together into the reality of it. Don't get me wrong, there's leadership in God's house, there's order in God's house. But if God just wanted Paul the apostle, one man, then he already would have come. He would have come in the New Testament. If he just wanted the three, if he just wanted the 70, God is looking, listen to me, it's not a numbers thing. It is a completion thing in measurement in Christ in a corporate man. Revelation 21 He who overcomes is going to inherit these things. He who, Revelation 13, is the patient of the saints. Revelation 14, 2, the perseverance of the saints. Matthew 24, 13. One, but he who endures and bears up under suffering to the end is what's being talked about here. These are the overcomers. Those who did not shrink back, Revelation chapter 12 overcame by the blood of the land, the word of their testimony, not loving their own life unto death. I love it in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 25. It says that the beast was given a time to overcome the saints. That's talking about the end. That's talking about physical. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is Revelation chapter 12 that though he might overcome them in their physical bodies, they overcame him because of the Lord Jesus Christ within them. And God's calling us to be those overcomers, so don't be afraid in this moment. I'm telling you, there's so much fear. If I could define what's going on in every arena, in every avenue, in the nation, and in the nation, it is fear. We are afraid of everything. We are unwilling to take a stand. And again, I'm not talking about Restoration Life Church here. I'm just talking about it in general. We are afraid to take a stand in any regard. So Revelation 21 verse 8, it says, But for the cowardly... For the cowardly, they're mentioned first, and then the unbelieving. Those two are not the same. And abominable and murderers, murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolater, idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And you're not going to like this one, and I'm open to correction by somebody, just no one in this room. No, I'm totally joking about that. (laughs) The Spirit of God, I believe, you weigh it, hit me. Again, this goes back to Daniel 12, so I'm trying to tie this in. In Matthew 24, 13. Who are the cowardly? Jesus said it. Those who endured to the end will be saved. 
Not those who just began. Those who stayed the course. Those who stuck in there as they were being refined and taken through the fire, who did not get offended with the living God, who did not question why they needed or tell the living God, oh, I'm already okay. I've already got what I need from you. I've already become Laodicea, right? We have it all. That people have insight and understanding to the work of God in their time and why they must be taken through the valley of the shadow of death, why they are destined for the furnace and the burning of the Lord. So they endure because it is, it is an answer to their prayer. The cowardly are those who would not endure. They were not saved because God is making a distinction. The time of gray area in God's house is coming to an end. And the fire of the day, the refinement, the difficulty, the affliction, inwardly and outwardly. And I said it before, I'll say it again. Sometimes the most afflicting thing is when God comes to your inner man and says, you're not who you think you are in me. Laodicea was defiant because they thought their lukewarmness was enough. God help us. Jesus said in Luke 21, 19, by your patient endurance... Empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will gain your souls. Yes. James chapter 1, verse number 4. Let endurance have its perfect result so that... Oh, you don't, let, don't let the church hear this. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James chapter 1, verse number 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have in, obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we celebrate in hope the glory of God. And not only this, we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. I'm telling you, I have not a lot of hope because proven character and the desire for it and the, the way it should be elevated in the house of God of a sign of spiritual maturity has been cast to the wayside for so-called gifting and so-called uh, personality. If we don't have an understanding that God's looking for character, meaning God's nature within us, how are we going to undergo tribulation and refinement that's meant to bring that forth? If we think it's gifting, if we think it's prophecy, if we think it's miracles, it changes the tra trajectory of our expectation and what we're seeking. Are you guys done being yelled at? I'm really not yelling at you. I'm just giving voice to what you guys would all say if you were up here. So I know. <laughs> God has not called us to be cowards in this time. God has called us to be men and women of God who are fearless and go through the valley of the shadow of death because it's in that valley where we learn to fear no evil. If we don't go through it, we will not learn the Lord in that way. Again, I'm not saying none of us has been through anything. I know we've been through it. It is a progressive process. But I'm also talking about straight out of the scriptures, 
what is coming upon the earth and those at the end. And I believe we're a part of it. And I do not want us to be unaware. I don't want us to be deceived to think, oh, this is just normal. We're just in a normal time. I don't want us just rebuking the devil while we're getting afflicted without say, asking God, God, what are you doing within me in the midst of this? And God, here's a prayer for you. And again, this hits right home because it's in my own home. God, don't let it stop until you bring your maturity that you have of yourself within me forth. There's three things, and I'll begin to pray about closing here. There's three things that this process of refinement are going to bear and bring forth. They're all interconnected. The first is testimony, an unprecedented testimony of the Lord Jesus in the earth. A measure of the fruit of the nature. I'm talking about Galatians chapter 5 fruit. A measure of the fruit of the nature of Jesus that has never been seen before in a corporate man. Though geographically that corporate body may be so separated by thousands of miles. Spiritually by nature and expression there will be a mission of the uh, measure of the Lord Jesus Christ that has never been seen before in a corporate body. Only when Christ walked the earth was it so seen. The second is unity in the spirit. Seems like a pipe dream, doesn't it? I mean that bad. Unprecedented unity. That, like I just said, is a life aspect, but there will also be, back to Daniel chapter 12, an insight and an understanding into what God is doing that brings us all on the same page. No longer just a preacher proclaiming it out, hoping people will get it, or someone in the congregation sit, sitting while a preacher doesn't get it. There will be a people that get it. And are going, excuse me, <clears throat> going forward in God together in it. I have more I'm going to say about this at a certain point this weekend, um, probably Sunday morning. But that is an incredible thing when people are on the same page and have the mind of the Lord. It's going to take God getting a hold of our carnal minds. It's going to take God giving us, hear me on this, restoration life. Giving us singleness of eye again. Without vision, the people perish. They stumble. With many visions, the people perish and the people stumble. Both are true. With singleness of eye to the Lord, we can run unencumbered, unentangled, not looking at each other, not blaming each other for not getting what we want, and we can be made ready for the Lord himself. True of the gathering. True for all of us. Singleness of eye. The Lord told me, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added. Put me in what I want first, and I'll do everything else that's needed. Whether that's taking care of us, whether it's the power of God that we think is so necessary, and again, God is extremely powerful and does great and awesome things, but we have to keep first things first. Isn't that right, Brian? You talked about first love. We have to keep the Lord himself first, and not just, and the Lord first in a way that gives him what he wants so that he has in his inheritance in us a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Unprecedented unity, not false unity around personalities, not uh, compromising with evil and calling it Christian unity, but a unity in what God wants. And the last one, and maybe the most difficult one for us to grasp, is, 
Testimony, unity, and confrontation. Resistance. Daniel was a man of resistance in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were men of resistance in Babylon. John the Baptist was a man of resistance in his time, confronting Herod over his incestuous relationship. Having his brother's wife. That Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, that shining of God's saints will bring us into a war against darkness. You can see it in Revelation chapter 12. God's kingdom has nothing in common with darkness. You are not called in any capacity to submit to it. Instead, you are called to expose it and challenging, challenge it by light. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation do not come to just be a part and fit in. They come to confront Do they not? God is going to have a church whose very existence is a threat to the devil. That's not just playing defense, but goes on the offensive. That, that some of us, hear, hear me, some of us, all of us really are called to be warriors of the Lord. And, I, and we need, we've been so kowtowed, we We've been put under this false mantle that we, to please God, have to submit to evil, to darkness. And yes, that comes at every level, including government. And I'm telling you, the body of Christ at the end will be in direct confrontation, a Psalm 2 dynamic with the governments of the earth in direct defiance and resistance telling them to either kiss the sun or be destroyed. Amen. Only Satan wins by making the church afraid to stand against evil and wickedness. Because where else does light come from and the truth come from? Except the pillar of the truth that the church of Jesus Christ is meant to be. That one right there might be the hardest one for the body of Christ. I have a message revolved around that whole thing. I'm going to do a recording in the comfort of my own comfortable area so that I don't have to see people's faces and opinions. We've got to be done with trying to be nice, make friends and influence people. Jesus was in direct confrontation with the spiritual leaders of his time. He didn't come among them and play nice. He was kind to give them the truth, but he would not compromise. And he would not hold back the truth. That light got him crucified. That light in the apostles got them killed and imprisoned. Yet Christianity, or rather Christ in his body, changed the world in that time. So, brothers and sisters... A time of refinement. I'll end with this. This is a type and a shadow perhaps, but stick with me for just a second. You see something 
This is so beautiful. Daniel chapter 7, you see the Ancient of Days come forward, and he has a kingdom to give to the Son of Man, which is Christ. And there's an interesting note there that from the throne of God in that time, again, this is the culmination of the age, there is a river of fire coming from the throne of God. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, you see from the throne of God a river of living water that's crystal clear. In that time, we're talking about the end now, when the new Jerusalem comes out, down out of heaven after the millennium, what God is giving forth to his own is a river of living water, clean, clear. But at the end, as we are in, in this moment, what's coming forth from the throne to his people is the fire of refinement. That fire is also, of course, a judgment for the wicked. But for us, it's a fire of refinement. The furnace of God is in Jerusalem. I don't really know how to end a message like this. Maybe just throw the mic and run. <laughs> I hope you've heard the heart of what I've tried to share tonight. It weighs on me, and I think it weighs on all of us. I think we can all sense, and perhaps I'm just giving uh, words to the sense that we have in our inner man of what's going on and where are we and what God's doing. Let me, hear, let me say this. So many are missing the work of God because it doesn't fit within the confines of their theology. Thus many will not be made ready. It will be a very small remnant. I pray, like you, that that remnant would be many, 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 many millions. I would pray that it would be billions. I would pray that it would be everybody. They understand that few there be that find the life because of the narrowness of the way. And that God prunes that which bears fruit and cuts off that which does not. You hear what I'm saying? For us, the way forward is further pruning of the Spirit of God. And it will achieve for us if we will stay the course in eternal weight of glory in a relationship with the Lord himself that far outweighs whatever we go through and experience. I'm telling you that when we stand before the Lord, if we continue to go on, and I'll say it this way, as we continue to go on, because every one of us is going to, right? As we continue to go on, we will look back at what we went through and we will consider it as nothing. We would do it a million or a hundred million times over and a hundred time, million times worse if it would bring us to that place that he's brought us to in relationship with him. So Lord, I ask for us tonight, if this has challenged our mindsets, I don't really think it has, I don't know. If this has challenged our mindsets, if this has encouraged us, Lord, whatever it's done, I ask for your aid from heaven that you, Spirit of God, would give us insight and understanding that we would not be those who are paralyzed by fear 
and do not have understanding of what is going on around us and what you're doing amongst us as a people. But we would have the insight of God, the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself prepared his own heart to suffer and go through what he went through for the sake of his body, that we, his body, would be prepared and have understanding and would be armed for the same purpose so that the head would get what he wants within. I pray, Holy Spirit, for the many across the nations who will hear and are hearing that you would ruin us in a real way for yourself. That we would be so in love and lovesick for the Lord Jesus. That these challenges That these tribulations, that these trials, that this suffering would do nothing but ignite our hearts in a deeper passion for you. I pray for spiritual understanding that you would enlighten our eyes to see what this is achieving within us for your, not ours, but for your glory in your body. I thank you, Lord, that you have not given up on the Western church here in America. We're proof of it and others. That your voice is still coming. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us an opportunity to suffer so that we can bear your name. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, Lord, that you are jealous for your testimony, and you jealously, James chapter 4, verse 5, jealously desire the spirit that you've placed within us. I pray, Lord, I want to pray this for us. Take this to heart if it feels right. I pray for us, Lord. Those of us, and I'll include myself, who've been, um, it sounds terrible to say, I'm not talking about because of Brian and Ken, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ for the past 2,000 years. For those of us who've had this thing called Christian religion heaped on us, and it's weighing us down and holding us back, and it's affecting us in our minds and challenging what you're saying right now in the moment. Lord, I ask for your uh, true grace to come and to purge it out of us. That there would be true breakthrough in this arena. That we could believe you again. And not believe me. Josiah, believe the Lord. We could believe in your gospel, the gospel of your son. And we could believe in the coming and the desire for God to return and to have a bride that's readied for him and a bride that's made herself ready. And it's not impossible. It is your will. And you are speaking it clearly and the scriptures testify it to it completely. I ask, Lord, that you would unyoke us from the intellectual Christianity that has plagued your people. And that we would, Lord, with cleanliness of heart and mind, come into this now moment with you. And it would have a true effect in our hearts 
at every level, spirit, soul, body. Lord, you've brought us to this moment. We've stumbled in it, into it, <laughs> not knowing, but you're, you're being, being so, I believe, so clear with us as to what you're after, what you're doing, and what's going to be going on in your house. So, Lord, we just receive, I do, receive of you in this time. Receive of your work, receive of your process, receive of your will, receive of your love, receive of you the grace of God to bring us through. Lord, I don't want to be afraid of the river of fire that's coming out from your throne right now. I don't want to be afraid. I want to be filled with the courage of God. The courage of God to stand. We can only get so long, brothers and sisters. Lord, we know this is not by might nor power. It's by your Spirit. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit given to teach, to train, to reveal, and to make ready. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that your work and the testimony that only you can bring forth would come forth. The unity of the Spirit would come forth. And Lord, I pray... Last thing, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be the backbone in your church and this time to stand and be the vessel of confrontation that you've called us to be. Nothing of the flesh or the anger of man or being involved in the right battles, that's wrong battles, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the right battle. Light versus darkness. Yes. Truth versus the lie. True good, which is only in God, versus evil. And a people unwilling to bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar or King Darius. Who would rather face death than compromise the testimony? Where has that been in the church of Jesus Christ? It's coming back. Lord, let it come back within us. Grip us, Lord. Grip us, Holy Spirit. I pray that that fear that has been heaped on us for so long just to fit in and not seek the distinction that God brings... Again, I'm not talking about being some religious prideful zealot. It's the opposite of that. <laughs> being humbled and stripped by God down to your very personality. It's hard to be prideful when you see that nothing of you is good. Everything is filthy rags. And the only thing that's good within you is a treasure called Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you, the church has been so lulled into that place where you can't say anything because you were once that way. That's absolutely true. And without God, we would forever be that way. But God aims to have a testimony of his son. He doesn't want you hiding in the corner.
He aims to have a body that the testimony of his nature comes through. This is not a pursuit of trying to become perfect in our own strength. No way was I speaking about that tonight. I'm just going to head that off at the pass. You guys know me enough. We're talking about people being baptized in Jesus' life. And the chips fall where they fall. So, Lord, have it in us. All this is unto God, not unto man. Unto God, where it's always meant to be. I thank you, Lord, that you have a people here in Atlanta. And I don't, it doesn't matter what men see or don't see this body. In the spirit, you have a light of confrontation. You have something that's unto God. I thank you for it. So, Lord, let it be done unto us in accordance with your eternal will. May we be refined, purified, made white, without spot or wrinkle. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Josiah. That was an awesome message. Yeah. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, Terry, they're going to start coming to hear Josiah instead of you, man. (laughs) Just kidding. Yeah. That was awesome, Josiah. It was really, really powerful. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. So we're going to take up an offering now. Um, and so we, we are the opposite of the prosperity gospel. Instead of double for your trouble, we give you trouble for your double. So <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. But uh, we, we do, in all seriousness, want to sow into Terry and Josiah for all that they're doing and just, just to really bless them. I, I think... I think giving when you listen to a message you're receiving is, is so important to the Lord. So we want to give in person. And also, if you're, if you're online watching right now, the link to give is give.restorationlife.org. Give.restorationlife.org. Uh, there should also be a link in the description there you can give as well. So just want to encourage you to be generous there. Um, we meet back tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. So just you know, we I, I, the the first night is always the breakthrough, but I feel like we broke through really quick, which is great. So um, want to encourage you to be back tomorrow morning at 10, and then also we have uh, Terry's books are in the foyer there, and he has the policy of um, is just to give a love offering for his books, and you know books are 10 to 20 dollars somewhere in there, just. So into that, if you don't have the money, he says, just take one anyway. So, you know, just read as long as you're going to read it. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to get his uh, books and resources there. And uh, other than that, we uh, just say, God bless you. Let me just close in prayer and uh, ask the Lord just to seal his work for tonight. So, Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for the wonderful message that from Josiah was so powerful uh, we thank you for, Lord, the, the fire of God on that, and just pray that you would seal up the work that you have initiated uh, tonight, Lord, just the work of encouragement for those who are going through afflictions and trials, that they would be encouraged and they would see the purpose for their pain. Father, let them see the purpose for their pain and the reason for what they're going through, we pray. And uh, we ask you for that, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, that you would just seal up this work by the Spirit of the Lord. And I pray tonight we would go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And uh, Lord, we would have the joy of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.